Hi children, here we are with our next chapter, Laws of Motion. In this video, we will be discussing about Newton's Laws of Motion. Newton's first law, second law and third law. You know children, Newton formulated his laws of motion as a continuation of Galileo's observations. So let us see all the three laws in detail. Newton's first law of motion. It states that every body continues to be in the state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced external force. So we have a car over here and the car moves only when an unbalanced external force is applied on it. So any body continues to be in the state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced external force. Now let's see another example. The ball which is at rest moves only when an external force is applied on that. When the boy kicked the ball, the ball moved. Now children, let's perform an experiment. Place a coin on top of the cardboard kept over a glass. Flick the cardboard suddenly. When you flick the cardboard, what did you see there? The coin which was at rest before the cardboard was pulled this falls back into the glass. When you pull the cardboard, the coin show the tendency to remain at rest. The coin doesn't move along with the cardboard, isn't it? It falls back into the glass. This tendency is known as inertia of rest. So what is inertia of rest? The tendency of a body to remain in its state of rest or its inability to change its state of rest by itself. And what is this inertia? It is the inability of a body to change its state of rest or uniform motion along a straight line by itself. Now let's see what happens when we are in a moving vehicle, whether it is a car or a bus and it stops suddenly. What happened? When we stop suddenly, we bump forward towards the steering. So to avoid this, first thing what we have to do is we have to wear seat belts, right? Now let's see what is happening in detail. Let's see what happens to the passenger who is sitting in a car or a bus which stops suddenly. If you are in the car and the car stops suddenly, you bump forward. Your upper part of the body goes and hits forward. And why is this so? A passenger sitting in a moving car is in motion. We are in the state of motion when we are sitting in a moving car. When the moving car stops suddenly, the passenger is pushed forward because of inertia. The lower part of the body comes to rest with the car, while the upper part tends to continue its motion due to inertia. Our upper part continues to be in motion, whereas the lower part of the body comes to rest along with the car. So don't you think children, seat belts play a very important role while you are driving a car? Always wear seat belts for your safety. Now let's see what happens when a vehicle starts suddenly. What happens? The upper part of the body is pushed back, isn't it? Now why does this happen? 
When a car starts suddenly, the passengers sitting inside tend to fall backwards. This is so because the lower part of his body starts moving along with the car. But the upper part tries to remain at rest due to inertia of rest. The lower part of the body will move along with the car. Whereas the upper part remains at rest. Children, let's see another example of inertia of motion. Here we have a girl running on a track. Was she able to stop herself at the finishing point? No. This is inertia of motion. So what is inertia of motion? It is the inability of a body to change its state of uniform motion along a straight line by itself. Now, you know what is inertia, right? It is the inability of a body to change its state of rest or uniform motion along a straight line by itself. Children, haven't you experienced the same thing? When you are on a running track and when you reach the finishing point, you are unable to stop yourself at the finishing point. Always we move a little bit forward after the finishing point. That is the inability of a body to change its state of uniform motion along a straight line by itself. That is what is inertia of motion. Now we know what is inertia of motion. Let's have an example over here. When you switch off the fan, the fan doesn't stop all of a sudden. It rotates a bit more and then stop. This is an example of inertia of motion. Now children, let's see Newton's second law of motion. And what does Newton's second law of motion state? It states that the rate of change of momentum of a body is directly proportional to the unbalanced external force acting on it and takes place in the direction of the force. Now let's have an example. Here we have a boy riding a bicycle. Newton's second law of motion says that acceleration happens when a force acts on a mass. Riding your bicycle is a very good example of this law of motion at work. Your bicycle is the mass, your leg muscles pushing on the pedals of your bicycle is the force. So now what do we understand? It's very clear that force is the product of mass and acceleration. Now, let's see the derivation of Newton's second law of motion. Mathematically, this can be written as F directly proportional to dp by dt. We already know that according to the law, the rate of change of momentum of a body is directly proportional to the unbalanced external force. So, we have F directly proportional to dp by dt. This we can write it as F is equal to k dp by dt where k is a constant now we know that p is equal to mv that is linear momentum is the product of mass and velocity now we have f is equal to k d mv by dt so we substitute the value of p as mv over here. So we have f is equal to k d mv by dt. That comes out to be f is equal to km dv by dt. And we know that dv by dt that is the rate of change of velocity. And what is rate of change of velocity? Rate of change of velocity is acceleration. So, the equation comes out to be f is equal to k m 
a. k is a constant and the value of k is found to be 1. So we get f is equal to ma. That is Newton's second law of motion is proved. Now let's see what's an impulse. This is the result of very large force acting for a very short time. It is a measure of the total effect of the force. Children, have you seen a cricketer catch a ball while playing cricket? Have you ever caught a ball? What happens when the ball comes with high velocity, we pull our hand backwards a bit to catch the ball. If we don't pull our hand backwards, we will get hurt. While catching a ball, a cricket player lowers his hands because by doing so, he increases the time of catch. That is, the person increases the time to bring about a given change in momentum. And hence, rate of change of momentum decreases. This a small force is exerted by the ball on the hands. And you know, children, since force is a vector quantity, impulse is also a vector quantity. Impulse is an important concept in the study of momentum. An impulse is equal to the net force on the object times the time period over which the force is applied. We derive impulse from the equation F is equal to mass times acceleration, which comes from Newton's second law of motion. Now we know that Impulse is the result of a very large force acting for a very short time. That is, impulse is equal to force multiplied by time is the product of force and time. That is, I vector is equal to F delta T. Now, let's derive impulse from Newton's second law of motion. Now, according to second law of motion, we know that F is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration. And what is this acceleration? Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. That means F will be equal to mass multiplied by delta V by delta T. That is F delta T is equal to mass delta V. That is F delta T is equal to delta P since M delta V is equal to delta P. Let's see another example. When you jump from a high place, if it is on the muddy floor, we don't get hurt. What may be the reason? When we jump on a muddy floor, the floor is carried in the direction of the jump and the interval delta t for which the force acts is increased. So this decreases the rate of change of momentum and hence the force of the reaction. So we are hurt less. Now let's see Newton's third law of motion. And what is it? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Let's see an example. Here we have a person who is trying to come out of the boat. He is trying to land onto the shore from the boat. And see what happens when we try to come out of the boat. When we land out, the boat tends to move back. That means there is an equal and opposite 
reaction. Your action is you are trying to come out. Whereas the reaction is the boat is pushed back. Children, haven't you experienced this when you are trying to come out from a boat? When we try to come onto the shore from a boat, we always feel that the boat moves a bit backward and we tend to fall into the river or the sea, right? So there is an action and there is a reaction involved in this particular example. Now let's see another example. Here we have a balloon which is tied. What happens when you remove the string of the balloon? The balloon just moves up. The air in the balloon is pushed down, whereas the balloon rises up. That means there is an equal and opposite reaction. So the third law states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now let's take an example of the spring. When you push the spring, the spring too pushes you back. Children, what do we do while walking? While walking, we press the ground with our feet slanted. The ground exerts an equal and opposite force on us, which helps us in walking forward. That means for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Yes, children, let's have some fun now. That is your homework part. Your assignment, which I'll be giving through this video. Now, you know all the three laws with examples. Isn't it? Now, according to Newton's third law of motion, we have an example that is a swimmer swimming forward is the best example for this, right? Now, what you have to do is you have to guess what is the action and reaction involved here in this example. Please put your answer just down below in the comment section.